Bevenidos, worldwide fans of the planet is hottest entertainment with an edge. I'm Ian Fuego here, and I welcome you to my namesake program in Fuego Tainment for a very special presentation where I am going to be in kind of a rapido review fashion, giving my thoughts about uh, a book that I hadn't read since I was probably in junior high, if I remember correctly. So I was like maybe 13, 14, something like that, and I enjoyed the hell out of it but I had not revisited it until just this past week, and I even thought I had a paperback of it, so I don't know what the heck happened to it, so I purchased a new hardcover of Brave New World. Yeah, Aldous Huxley, written in 1931, published in 1932, at least here in the States. I'm not sure if it came out beforehand uh, over in the UK, but this is a movie that is all too often compared to 1984, which was written, what, like 15, 17 years later, something like that, post-World War II. This was post-World War I, and, you know, it just a much different time and place, but they both dealt with dystopian futures, uh, one being much scarier for reasons of, like, surveillance and just, you know, Big Brother and all that, obviously, in George Orwell's book. But Huxley's is a much more satirical and different beast for the sheer fact that it's, it's about just not only conditioning and all of that other stuff, but basically having every wonderful whim and inclination at your fingertips. And so it's a very different sort of scary future, and that's where the satire comes in. So I just reread this this past week for the sheer fact that the Peacock Network just launched with... Uh, well, it's basically NBC and Universal coming together to do a streaming service because it seems like everybody is doing a goddamn streaming service lately. I mean, HBO Max launched recently. We still have the big boys like Netflix and Amazon Prime and Hulu, and then we have smaller stuff like Shudder, which I really enjoy very much. And I mean, you've got CBS All Access. I mean, it just goes on and on and on at this particular point. The streaming wars are really getting nuts. But um, even though I have very mixed feelings, about a new, uh, possibly modernized version of this story, especially because of the fact that I also watched this past week the 1998 version with Leonard Nimoy and Miguel Ferrer and Peter Gallagher. Oof, that's for another video that I'm also filming this weekend. But as far as this book, just as a whole. And also there was a 1980 uh, miniseries as well that was done for NBC, and that one is quite faithful, and I'll talk about that on another video, like I said, but this book, this brilliant book, this prophetically frightening book in some ways, but once again, like I said, in a different manner than Orwell's book was. I personally prefer Animal Farm when it comes to Orwell, but that's not, neither here nor there. This is essentially about a uh, dystopian future where, as I said, there is, you know, just every wonderful carnal thing at your fingertips. Everyone belongs to everyone, so there's no real relationships. Everybody, it's like, you know, the almost free love hippie kind of thing, but also in this very cold and emotionless sort of future. And the reason for this, and the reason for the fact that, you know, everyone belongs to everyone, and it's all about, uh, the, I'm trying to remember the, the opening credo, it's a society, uh, oh goodness, uh, where, where are we at? Right at the very beginning. Uh, because it's all about community identity stability, that is basically the motto of the, the world, basically. And there's all of these, you know, controllers, there's ten different ones if I recall correctly and each of them kind of presides over these different regions of the entire planet, at least as far as the entire civilized planet. And the, the book starts out in this hatchery where we find out that, yeah, pretty much everybody are these like test tube babies of sorts. And it does, according to uh, my, my lady, have some faulty science. Once again, this was 1932. This is before they'd really discovered about DNA strands and things of that nature. So uh, this is science fiction also, keep that in mind. But at this hatchery, you know, the alphas, the, the incredibly smart elite people that are being just, you know, made essentially, you know, uh, they are one egg to an uh, actual grown person, but they're taking the eggs and splitting them for these more lower level workers and they come out as twins and so you basically get two people for each egg from all of these smaller, you know, just basically more remedial, uh, just engineered to be slower, to be more like the workforce as opposed to the intellectuals. And the conditioning during this initial tour that is described, and they go into in-depth detail about this, they, there's everything from you know, uh, environmental stuff, whether it's hot and cold, there is uh, this like 
hypno sleep kind of programming that's going on. There's, uh, I mean, and it's really so that certain people when they are created are more inclined based on how they've been conditioned to do certain forms of work like you know be in the mines be in you know specific sorts of climates and all this different stuff and there's also like electrical therapy and noise uh, the, the noise uh, you know just sort of conditioning and it's really startling and scary the way this book begins and we see just how this society functions and the creation of its predominant populace and it's pretty nuts and it's also very dense stuff this book despite being a little over 200 pages is incredibly dense in so many of its ideas and for for many it might be a hard read for me uh it's 14 or whatever i was when i first read it having not reread it since then there was so much that went over my head man so so much and so, i mean so much that has kind of come to be over time since I read it in the 90s and so very crazy in that regard but yeah so after this initial tour of the hatchery that's when we finally start to meet some of our our, our main main characters like we meet uh oh Tomakin uh who did we we learned some things about this dude and he's the director if I'm not mistaken and uh he's the he's a part of this tour that's going on initially and uh but yes we initially meet Bernard and we meet Lenina. And so Bernard, there is this whole thing that, hey, maybe he got some alcohol in his, uh, in his creationary process when it wasn't supposed to be in there. And so he's much shorter than all of the other alphas. And despite having this like very refined intellect, he feels he's kind of scorned a little bit. Uh, he feels like an outsider. And that's at least the way he is initially. But this character has a very strange arc as the story goes along. And the real crux of it is the fact that he has decided to go on holiday to the, uh, the, the savage uh, like reservation that is in New Mexico. And so they're going from London across the pond to the US and they, they go on this, this reservation to observe these savages, so to speak. And he takes Lenina with him. And so with the free sex thing that I mentioned, I mean, Lenina's seen other women and, uh, excuse me, other women. That is one thing that I will say about this book. It's still not like free love as far as like gay, you know, there's no men and men having sex with men or, you know, going with men and women and vice versa. It's still a heterosexual society, which since I haven't watched the Peacock version just yet, I'm very curious to see if that is explored. I would imagine it most definitely has to be. I mean, this, it's funny because from orgy porgies, because there's orgies in this book and there's, and all of that, you know, just everybody belonging to everyone and sleeping with everybody. And, you know, there's the, like, if you see somebody too many times, it'll look suspicious and people would start to talk. And that, I mean, so much of this isolation that isn't even promoted here, that's what Bernard likes being alone. He wants to spend time alone with Lenina even before they go to the reservation. And she's like, but whatever would we spend time alone for? I mean, you know, unless we're basically getting down on the get down or sleeping, I mean, what other, there's really no other point. And so there is just, the constant conditioning also is accompanied by the fact that everyone is kind of sedated to a slight degree because they're all taking this stuff called Soma, which is a drug that, I mean, there's no, there's no consumption of alcohol or any other stuff, but Soma is a constant thing. And uh, Bernard doesn't like it at all. He even says at one particular point to Lenina that I find very amusing. And this epitomizes his outsider status. He's like, I would rather be myself and nasty than someone else and jolly. And I was like, yeah, I can actually kind of relate to that <laughs> to a degree. So that epitomizes his character's initial perspective perfectly. And so, yeah, him and Lenina, they go on this trip to the Savage Lands. And this is where, like, that first bit of the story is very much with focusing on, uh, on Bernard and his character. But when they get to those, uh, to, to those reservation lands in New Mexico, they discover a woman who used to live in their, you know, just high-class society. Their, you know, their in industrialized everything. And uh, her name is Linda. And she apparently 
had uh, sex and was on the reservation and had a child because she wasn't able to actually, you know, she, she was left behind and uh, with, I'm not trying to completely spoil things here, but she was left behind and she was pregnant uh, with the uh, other man from the society, uh, the, the high society of sorts that was there with her. And uh, out of like shame, I guess, she doesn't even really, she never even really made any effort, but she has this son named John. And since there isn't supposed to be this whole family, you know, sort of dynamic, then she demands that John call her Linda as opposed to mother. And the whole free love thing creates major problems for her too because of the fact that she thinks everyone belongs to everyone. So she's like sleeping with all the other guys on the on the res and their women come after her at one particular point as it's mentioned. And so another interesting thing about John is he has discovered literature out there by William Shakespeare and it's a collection of a lot of stuff from him. Most notably, uh, a lot of people probably know that this, the title of this novel, Brave New World, comes from The Tempest by William Shakespeare, and that's also why I'm wearing a Maiden shirt, because Iron Maiden has an album called Brave New World. In a brave new world, a brave new world. Their comeback album from uh, 2000, I believe. It's also got The Wicker Man. God, that's such a great record. I digress, though, but uh, yeah, so the both of them, John and his mother Linda, are discovered on the res by Bernard, and he convinces uh, to, to, he basically somehow convinces the powers that be to allow him to bring the both of them back to London, and that's where the the shift starts to transpire. Earlier in the book, we're uh, introduced to somebody named uh, Helmholtz. I, I believe it's either Helmholtz or Helmholtz, but yeah, he's this he's this very tall, strapping, you know, what you would expect an alpha to be, and he he lectures and he teaches and he does certain things like that, but he feels creatively unfulfilled and he's working on his own written poetry and stuff and it's that's a very dangerous thing to be doing because you don't want anything subversive you don't want to create anything that could potentially shift minds aside from all of the protocols in place in this society already and so that's why art is pretty much disallowed that's why any sort of outside thinking when it comes to scientific process is disallowed which we have a great discussion about in chapter 16 of this book but yeah, so the Savage, John the Savage, comes back, and uh, Bernard is uh, basically the one to just kind of piddle him around and show him their society and take care of him and care and just look after him and just kind of introduce him to everything that, you know, this more civilized existence entails. And he's quoting Shakespeare along the way, you know, whether it's Othello or Romeo and Juliet or whatever. And he immediately takes an affinity to Lenina. And she's, she's attracted to him too, but she is just so ingrained with the norms of her way of living. And he is so caught up in his own that despite this kind of Romeo and Juliet-esque, you know, from different sides of the of you know society and existence in general, you know different sides of the tracks, reveling families and ideals, whatever. Um, they are still attracted to each other, but it is it is a contentious attraction, and it is one that uh, it, it entails resentment and frustration on both of their parties, really, but more so for John. And yet, as as time goes on, and Bernard starts to realize that John doesn't want to be just shown off by him and just made into this and just very I, I don't know like one trick pony kind of like oh look at the savage everyone wants to meet the savage and as his social status starts to rise he realizes oh Bernard's just using me essentially to up his own status and um, you know just just climb that proverbial ladder of uh, you know caste system whatever the hell you want to say and be more renowned and prominent and respected even though he had you know, Dude was about to get sent off to Iceland for just being this outcast and doing weird things that were red flags. And so this is where the focus definitely shifts to John as our main character, despite the fact that, you know, he has shown up nearly halfway through the book, I think it is. It's at least like 60, 70 pages in, whatever it may be. It's a good, it's a good chunk into our story when he finally shows up. And he finds a bond with Hemholtz because of the fact that they, they bond over, you know, poetry and over that form of self-expression. And without really getting into too much more, since this is about halfway, half to two-thirds of the way through the book, it, it just turns into such a commentary 
uh, even more so than earlier when this big showdown of sorts kind of goes down and some stuff that happens with Linda, John's mother, as is the, the loaded term in this society. And, and just to backtrack, one thing that, uh, it, that I believe it's a director that says it uh, in that first chapter where they're touring the hatchery and he just, he spits upon the family dynamic and just how it, it created bad mentalities in mothers and like, you know, oh, just leering over their children like some, you know, cat with her, you know, kittens and stuff like that. And, you know, how living in these confined quarters and, you know, how it breeds disease and all these different things. And also so much stems from the fact that Henry Ford, it was like, you know, since he was the one who invented, uh, you know, basically one of the fathers of American industrialization and uh, you know the assembly line and all that different stuff and so everything time-wise is mentioned as AF after Ford and so that's just funny the fact that they hold this man in high regard not so much as a god or anything like that but hearing them talk about you know back many years ago before the nine-year war and all this other stuff where society had this whole reshuffling process that went down he the, the, the director proceeds to tell all of these young students that he's giving the tour to he's like there was ideas of things called god and souls and you know he, he just it's fascinating just the disregarding of so many of these things that would make people inherently more emotional religion definitely induces emotion within people as does science, really. Those are the two, you know, the eternal war of religion versus science and all that other shit. But yeah, these are themes that are heavily explored in this. And so that's why self-expression like art and stuff that, I mean, anything that induces emotion is what they are trying to do away with or diminish in as many possible capacities as they can. And these are just really fascinating ideas. And after the stuff goes down with Linda's mother, with uh, John's mother, Linda, as I mentioned, and he's had these relational conflicts with trying to court Lenina, basically, and realizing it just might be a lost cause, not to spoil anything. But yeah, it all really rises to a head when there is a meeting in chapter 16, the aforementioned chapter 16, possibly my favorite uh, portion of this book. And it's where, like, Mustafa, who is this, uh, or Mustafa, however you, you pronounce it, I'm not 100%, but he's basically, I, I, I believe he's the, he's the controller of this portion of Western Europe, and so he meets with uh, John, and with Bernard, and with Hemholtz, and it basically turns into Mustafa, Mustafa, whatever his name is, basically explaining to them all of those aforementioned things that I said about suppression of art and self-expression, uh, any sort of deviation in science and also religion and various other things. But yet, since he's the one in power, he's the one in control, he has some of this literature. He's familiar with Shakespeare. He's familiar with the Bible. And there's even murmurings early in the book that, yeah, the end of, we hear he has some of those forbidden tones and whatnot. And yeah, he's got some of that stuff without getting super spoilery. But the discussion between the four of them is utterly fascinating and it's some of my favorite passages in the entirety of Brave New World and the ending is kind of a shocker to a degree and it's not I mean as you would probably expect from a piece of work like this and I, I feel like I've said about as much regarding my my adoration for this amazing piece of literature one of the most important of the 20th century obviously and one that if you haven't read Brave New World, I cannot recommend enough to check this out. Once again, it's very dense with ideas, but it still has a pretty straightforward plot, at least. Now, all of the other stuff that is presented to you to ruminate on and think about as far as the natures of, you know, society and conditioning and all of these other things, that's, that's where this book is very special. It has so much more to say than just its very simple story of, you know, somebody goes on holiday, finds a savage, brings savage back into society, and just the reverberations that emanate after the introduction of that person. And it's, it's fascinating stuff. I mean, seriously, the fact that they encourage kids to, you know, have their little sex games and so on and so forth. I mean, just the, the treatment of that especially is probably what will be perceived as the most controversial in some ways, aside from that really hardcore conditioning 
that is outlined in that first book when, excuse me, in the first chapter where they're touring the hatchery and stuff. But man, the, the prose is pristine and I just, I, I, I love this book. You definitely, if you are a fan of social satire, science fiction, it is such a brilliant blending of the both. And uh, I give this five out of five Fuego Fireballs. This is a in Fuego, not just certified Fuego, five, yo, that is right. Cinco, it is a incredible read and I can't, uh, cannot tell you enough about uh, how you need to take your time. Ma I don't know if I would say watch it before the Peacock show because I haven't watched the Peacock show and I'm very, I, I'm slightly leery of it to be honest, but it will be interesting to see a TDMA approach and I feel like they can really explore some of that carnal side that in the other two adaptations that I've seen, the 1998 one and the 1980 one, was only hinted at. So I extend a gran gracias for you tuning into this video. I have been Jaime in Fuego, and you can find me on all social media sectors like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, here on YouTube. My personal channel is on the verge of a uh, big kind of shift of gears uh, in uh, early August, presumably August 1st. Um, that's when I'm going to start doing a live program called Geek and Rewind that I've been planning on for a while, and I'm thinking it's also going to be a dueling podcast. I've, I've been slowly kind of recalibrating and deciding how many big time reviews I still want to do. Do I want to, you know, do a, a crap ton of content, have like a new review every day, like I did the first few months of this whole quarantine thing, like we've had this past. Uh, well, it's. And all the days and months and weeks have blended together. It's been crazy. But yeah, I was going full force with reviews for a while there and I wasn't seeing the type of growth that I wanted. And as I, I love reviewing stuff and I'm not going to stop doing that. But there is, a, as the journalist that I was for many, many years and still am on my other channel, youtube.com slash the horror show channel, uh, I've, I've been reviewing and discussing film for like six years at this particular point. But I'm passionate about discussing entertainment news specifically, and that's honestly what I want to uh, just attack full force with uh, Geek and Rewind, and then maybe expand into further sort of uh, live discussions and things of that nature. But uh, yes, uh, liking and sharing and subscribing and showing that love here means a heck of a lot to me. And uh, yes, uh, thanks so very much once again for tuning in. I've been Fuego, y'all have been Rad Status, and until the reel of Ka comes around once more, hasta luego, sin amigos, constant viewers and readers, in this case, I like say thank you. And uh, yeah, I'm hopeful that we share more of this palaver sooner rather than later. And until then, stay home and uh, definitely read more books.